Hello and welcome to Speak Easy. This is a live discussion panel show um, and we're speaking about different topics that affect our Black communities. Um, it's a confidential space, so we don't make reference to who you are, your name or anything like that. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat box. You can send any emails over to speakeasy at the bha.org.uk. Um, please, let's treat each other with respect as well. Um, we're all entitled to opinions, but let's be respectful with that as well. Um, is there anything else that I've missed out on? No, you're fine. Right. Okay, so I'm Chantal and I work at the BHA. And I'm Yvonne and I volunteer with George House Trust. And go on. So today we have a special guest who is Reverend Lara Akinola. Um, can I just start by asking how you would like me to address you? Would you like me to use Reverend or Lara? I'm happy to be addressed as Lara. Lara, okay, thank you. So today we are joined by Lara Akinola and we are going to speak today about faith and leadership in the 21st century. So um, Lara, thank you. And just to say as well, the reason why I asked that question um, because I wanted to make sure that I did address you um, how you wish. I know that, you know, some people would prefer to use that title. Um, and is there a reason why you are, you know, it's not something that you have to be um, addressed by using Reverend, you're happy to use Lara, or is it just a personal preference? It's a personal preference, yes. I mean, the title has its place, um, but I don't always um, use it everywhere I go. So are you confident, is it because you're confident with your status or is it because you're so well known in your community that people don't need to use it? It's, um, it's primarily because it is a title and sometimes titles can um, stand as a, 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 a block between, you know, uh, between people trying to form a relationship or trying to have a conversation. Um, it has its place. There are places and times when I would insist on being addressed as Reverend Lara Akinola because that is who I am. It is an office. Um, however, my assignment is to serve people. So when people see the title or hear the title before they hear me, sometimes they are hesitant, you know, in terms of what they say to me or be careful or craft their words carefully. And then I wouldn't get, um, I wouldn't get to understand them properly or where they're coming from. So I like people to be relaxed with me and, and to be able to have a conversation with them because that will help me then to know how to serve them better. And I think that was really interesting when I first met you because you always referenced in terms of how I can serve better. And I just, for me, I stepped out of the church because I had so many issues with it and the fear factor that I felt that church wheeled over people. Why are you so different then? Why are you looking at yourself in terms of serving people and not saying serving God and creating that? distance i am serving god um nobody has seen god physically um but people who are serving god serve the people so when you serve the people you are serving god because god will not come down physically to serve the people himself he's going to depend on people like us who have taken the oath i took the oath to be his messenger to be his ambassador and so my focus has to be on that. My focus has to be on the oath that I took before God, you know, to serve his people, to be a shepherd. So the title, as I said, has its place. It's, it's, it's a formality. And there are places where you would insist on using that formality. As, I suppose um, sometimes, um, which I have had experience of that as well, is that unfortunately, sometimes some people um, come up with attitudes of irreverence 
you know, towards the towards the pastor or the reverend or or you know the minister, it, we need to address that as well because it is a noble calling. It's an honourable position, and somebody who is serving you, somebody who is supporting you, who is praying for you, um, it is Bible commands that you honour them. Okay. So so. I'm able to bring correction where I feel that correction is necessary, but that should not be a reason why um, I should be unreachable, unrelatable, and people are not able to reach me because then I, I can't serve God in the abstract. I have to serve the people. So you're then saying I'm serving God. You, so part of your being able to reach people is to understand the context that they're in. And one of those things is about breaking down that divide without losing the respect that or people absolutely. being this right. Okay, yeah, then. Absolutely. Do you think people's faith or let me rephrase that people's attitude to religion, has it changed? Because you've talked briefly about someone being disrespectful of the position. Why do you think that's so? Yeah, I think some people are disrespectful of the position because some people have been hurt by the people who hold, by some people who hold the position. Um, it, it, I have I have had encounters with people who unfortunately don't want to have anything to do with the church anymore because they they decide that it's the church, you know, not the person, but it's the church that has hurt them. And so they have this attitude of um, um, dishonoring them because they think that, well, why should, I, why should I respect you? You yourself are not respected. You haven't respected me. You have dishonored me. You have abused me or you have crossed the line. So why should I respect you? And I think that because of that, some people just have, not everybody, but some people have a broad view of Christendom, of, of pastors, or Christian leaders of any sort, or even the church, you know, because of the unfortunate experiences that they have that they have had in the particular church that, that they were part of. Okay, and that's yeah. a good point. So yeah. if we whiz back then, you have a calling to minister, but tell us more about yourself and how that ministry happened. What is it something that you've always had? It would be useful for people to know because I think even for me, it's rare that I see female ministers. So I would well. love to know how the calling happened for you. Yeah, I'm interested to know about like who you are and what you Yes, how the calling happened to me. Yeah. Um, I Do you know when I was in my, in my teens and in my late teens, I used to imagine myself like just see picture myself preaching you know I, I would um picture myself preaching in my mom's church and I would see so many people the church was packed out back in Nigeria I am Nigerian um and you know I would probably be going to work or walking on this but I would see this picture I didn't understand what it meant I thought it was just my own imagination because I have very active imagination Oh, but also I loved to read the Bible then. I, I just would read the Bible and I wasn't like a practicing Christian or going to church or anything. It was just something that you could almost say it was innate that I just loved to do, naturally drawn to do. And um, I, would, I would pray, I would read the Bible. I would never go to church or anything like that. But then in my early twenties, um, a friend invited me to church um after work and I went with her to, to church and it was like wow this is the thing that I've been seeing in my mind all this time you know I, I felt drawn to it and I became a Christian then um but then fast forward to how, how my calling actually came about is uh, was very dramatic it was a dream or a vision if you like um where I found myself in the in, in 2000, in the year 2000, um, I, I, I found myself, like there was this great big house, massive, massive, um, if you can imagine like Buckingham Palace or some, a big building like that, but it was white. I can still see it even now. It was white and the gates 
that you were going through was black, jet black, glossy black cast iron, very high gate. And somehow I went there, I kicked that gate, the gates in and I went in. And if you can imagine that the building was like um, rectangle. Yeah. It was rectangle. And there were um, cells, like rooms, but there were cells around the, you know, the, the building. So you go, you can literally go in there. There are cells and there were women in these cells. And in the corner, in one corner of, of, that, of that property, was like a palace where a man was there who was um, reigning over the women and he had his henchmen so he would get one of his henchmen to go and get one of the women and he would use her and would throw her back in the um, in the cell mm -hmm. so I found myself just like I, I was flying I flew in there kicked the door in uh, the gate down and I was opening the the cells I was like opening all the rooms, all the cells. And so there was chaos pandemonium. The woman was crying and they, were, they, they could not go. And I said, no, we have to go. Come on, let's go. And the, the henchman came, the guy who was uh, uh, working for the guy, they came trying to fight me, but I, somehow I was able to defeat all of them. And they said to me, you need to run away now because it still has one that is left. And that if if he bites you, you are, you know you're going to die. It has poisonous teeth, and so I said, okay, let him come and bite me then. So he he too was flying. Remember, I said that I was flying in this dream. Yeah. He too was flying, but he flew at me from the back. He didn't come at me from the front. He flew at me from the back of my right hand. He bit me on the neck. Yeah. So I just swung for him. Just well, just swung for him, and bam, he was dead on the floor. And so the, 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 the guy who was reigning, oh, excuse me, who was reigning over all of them. So he had like a helicopter on the roof and he flew away. So I, so I did my arms like this. So the ladies and I linked arms yeah. and said, we're gonna fly now. So what, and because they began to chase us. And I said, once we reach into that cloud, they would not be able to reach us anymore. And so, um, so we flew, we linked arm, um, and we, we all flew into the sky, into the cloud, and the, if the helicopter could not reach us anymore. It, and I woke up, it's like, goodness gracious, what kind of weird dream is this? What am I supposed to do with this? And I felt the Lord said to me that I have called you with the comfort with which you have been comforted to go and comfort others. So that was the beginning of my ministry. Um, it was in 2000, but I was not brave enough to launch out until 2001. And, and that was the beginning of uh, the Woman of Substance Evangelical Ministries. Then fast forward to 2005, I had another dream. <laughs> so another dream, uh, it was a big, massive city. I was in that city and there was, everybody was happy. There were the families, the daddy was going to work. Children uh, were going to school. Everybody was happy, but there were these four men. Have you, did you see the film Men in Black? Yeah, totally, yeah. So the four men were dressed exactly like that. They had a wand in their hands. So um, they, would, they would stretch the wand at people and anybody they stretched it at, that person would be zapped out. They'll just disappear. Yeah. So they were zapping people, like they were just disappearing. So they almost emptied the whole city. And so um, in, in, in a moment, I was translated into the city, into another, the place where these people were translated to. But it happened to be another city that is um, a replica of the city where they've been zapped away from, just like a copy, if you like. Yeah. Um, but they were so miserable. The children were in jail. The, the parents were fighting. It was just a horrible, horrible, horrible city. The children were crying. The young people, it, it was a mess. And I was made to walk up and down that city. The city itself was ugly. It was just so bad. And these four men were there in that city. And they were in the car. And they were even like... Um, uh, prison cells were like cages on the streets where the young men were in and the 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 the, the, 
fathers were out, you know, we refused to come. It was just horrible. And the Lord said to me to zap them back to where they came from. Now, I didn't have a wand, but I had a finger. So I had to point my finger at them. So I would point and say, fire. And they would disappear back to where they came from. So I zapped everybody back. And so I was caught up in the air. I was going and I had an aerial view of that ugly city. So the Lord said to me to not leave it like that, to point down at that city and say fire. So I shouted fire and the whole city was engulfed in fire. Wow. And then I woke up. <laughs> but you've had some really powerful, and, and, and I know that in faith visions are really important and even speaks for to me a lot them, yeah god speaks yeah. to me a lot in pictures and, and the, very symbolically as well oh, yes. oh, yes. you talked a lot about women so do you, is your oh, ministry oh, specifically for women have you been called to make a difference in women's lives and tell us about that because you spoke earlier of your first uh, yeah. vision I, I, yeah in 2000 yeah. and it was about women so i'm it was about women Go on. That's how my ministry started. But the second vision is, is my pastorate um, calling. It's my pastorate assignment to everybody. So that, that was just to let me know, because obviously when you have a dream like that, or a vision like that, and you want to seek, uh, want to seek God to say, what, is, what does this mean? You don't just get up and, and start doing. Um, so the second vision was about my pastoral calling generally. But specifically, I was called and and initially I was called to women and I still work with women and that ministry the woman of substance is still up and running it's still going since 2001 and that how I, I uh, how do I do that it's via um, workshops and seminars counseling um, um, you know people will call me and and say this is what I'm going through you know and stuff like that uh, but also um, facilitating their personal development as well. And their Tell me more work. about that. Yeah, because I remember when we were talking as well, what I was really impressed with was that your own life mirrored some of the images that we're talking about now, because you said you're a mother raising your daughters and they've achieved so much. So I can also see how that would reflect in your ministry do you want to tell the audience about your life and how Absolutely. that works with the women's ministry as well? Well, I, I was married in um, December 88. Mm -hmm. um, and between December 88 and February 93, I've had three children, <laughs> two oh. girls and a boy. Somebody made a joke and said do you not have telly or something why <laughs> it's a long-standing <laughs> joke yeah 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 so I've had three children within five five years and um it was a very bad marriage it was very very abusive in every way it was sexually abusive it was financially abusive it was physically very abusive it was emotionally abusive now, I came into marriage very, very naive. I was 23 when, when we got married in, in December 88. I did not know, um, I hadn't had experience of, or I didn't have so much experience. And, and we were here, our parents are back home in, in Nigeria. So um, I was naive. I just believed everything he told me. I, be, I believed, I tend to believe everything people tell me. I mean, why would you lie to me? And stuff like that. <laughs> so he, he took advantage of my naivety. Um, it was horrible. Um, it took a lot, and still I would not let him go. And he would leave me, I would be looking for him. Mind you, this was before the day of internet, you know, I would look for him, I would find him, I'd say, no, I'm not going to be a single parent. We've got three children, we're gonna raise them together. You know, it was horribly abusive, you know, you know, very violent. So, um, so now I'm able to relate, having been there, Yes. and when he left, when he finally left, um, and I allowed him to leave. Um, I, I reminded myself of who I was before I got married, before I came to the UK. I was, I was driven, I was highly ambitious. I had so much energy, so much power. Uh, I inspired a lot of my friends, a lot of people around me. That's who I was. And why would I let that person die? 
you know, so I decided that I was going to, um, you know, live my dream, basically become who I was supposed to become. Um, and so I went back to university. I did um, postgraduate diploma in management studies. I got the best job, you know, um, started raising my children. And then I went back in, in the year 2000, did a master's in HR management, became a consultant, bought the biggest house I could find, just began, began to live my life. And because I was able, I mean, that's the abridged version of it. Obviously there are trials and things in between, yeah. but I fought everything. And because some people were able to see what I was going through. And in spite of that, you know, I have been able to achieve all the things that, that I've achieved. I raised my children, all three of them, two girls and a boy. They all went to university, they're doing great you know, they're all doing great. Without, you know, I decided it was a personal decision because some people thought that was because I was, um, I'm a Christian. No, it was a personal decision to not be married, to not get married. Again, because mm. I just thought, do you know what? I've done the marriage thing. You know, I need to live, I need to become who I am. I'm supposed to become, uh, set that aside and be an example for my children because I want them to know that they can become whatever it is that I want to become, whatever dream that you have in your head, because you have it, it is achievable. Um, so that attracts a lot of people to me. Yes. Because um, I was going to say, it must, if you've come from cultures where religion is really significant, how do you stand as a woman? Because for most of us, to be a single mother, but then to be a single mother of faith as well, it makes it easier, I can see, for you to talk to other women, but how did you find the courage to stand within your community and still have that strength? Because I would have thought, would your community not have beat you down because you were leaving a relationship? I tried to, even in spite, to, to be fair, you know, to the church where I was a part of at the time, they saw the abuse and everything and they did their best to to, to look after me because it was a pathetic situation. You can't not see it, you know. It was always happening. I'm sorry, I pray with this woman every six o'clock and I'll, oh, I'll call her later. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So, and, and I should have actually uh, um, put it on silent. I'll do that now once she goes. Yeah, so they, you, they, you, like I said, I have to remember who I am, you know. Um, First and foremost, I'm a child of God, and I have to remember that. And I take my strength and I take my inspiration from the Word of God, from having a personal relationship with God, regardless of what anybody else says. Um, in terms of my community, there have been instances and continue even today to be instances where um, they will do their level best to um, categorize you and, and label you, but everybody is entitled to their opinion. That's your opinion of me. I don't have to accept it. You can have your opinion, but I don't have to accept because ultimately I'm not accountable to you. Ultimately I'm accountable to God. And that is the attitude that I have. And that attitude has helped me, you know, over the years to be focused on who I am I've been, even, even when I was working, you know, I told you I was a um, consultant, uh, HR consultant, strategic consultant. Yeah. I, have, I have consulted in organizations where I was the only black and I was the only female on the, on the board of director. Okay. Everybody, yeah. So all the directors were there. I would be the only black and I would be only female. So that's double barrel. And I was able to hold my own because as an authority in my own field, you don't know what I know. Because if you knew what I know, you would not be doing, you would be doing my job. The fact that I'm here means that I'm the subject matter expert and I will come and assert that authority. So it is important to be able to carry yourself in that way. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the workshops that I run is um, being confident without being, uh, being assertive without being arrogant. Because another, another way that I've found that people of faith or Christians would want to beat you down is to say, oh, you can't say that, you know, you, you, then, then you're proud, then you're arrogant. No, you're not. You, you, 
I'm not going to deny myself. You mustn't deny, if you're good at something, then say I am good at it without being, you know, cocky about it. Or but, but come out and say that, oh yes, I can do this. I'm very good at this. You mm -hmm. can be confident because people need to know what you have to offer in order for you to be able to, to, to you know, serve people because we're all here, everybody's here to serve. But in order for the people to benefit from your gifts, from your talents, you, they need to know what it is. But if you continue to cower and say, because I don't want them to think that I'm proud, I don't want them to, then nobody's going to know what you have to offer. So it's very, very important. That is the attitude that I've adopted. And like I said, before I got married, I don't know, maybe because I, I was in, in a very bad marriage um, that made me decide, do you know what? Never again, never again. I, am, I know what I'm here to do and I'm going to get here and do it. And the reward for me, and not, not just the reward, but the, the motivation also that keeps me going is to see the difference in people's lives. Yeah, because I was going to say, in some ways, because you've had that experience, does it translate into the courses and sessions that you put on? And when you're targeting women, do you have to be mindful then about relationships between men and women in marriage? Do you counsel the men as well as the women? Mm -hmm. Is it about changing the mindset or I, do you I just strengthen the women? I am passionate about that because men also have... Um, you know, you know this saying that if you do, if people who know better do better. Yeah. Men, yeah. unfortunately, have been, have, some of them have not got, um, um, even though we give them bad rap, we, we give them bad uh, uh, names or whatever, but look at where they've come from and look at how they've been brought up. Look at how they've been socialized. Oh, boys will be boys. You know, instead of them to, to nobody has actually affirmed them to say, listen, you, you are, you are, you are, you are an image of God. God has created you in his image. You, you, have, you, are, you are the express image of God and you, you are a husband, okay? You are supposed to provide. You are supposed to, to protect. None of this, not many people are taught, not, not many men are taught these things that said that, oh, boys will be boys. No, you are not an animal. You have the spirit of self-control. There is, there is, um, there's a scripture that says that um, that talks about the fruits of the spirit. You know, one of the fruits of the spirit is self-control. Okay, so you're not controlled by your by your uh, uh, instinct. You know, you have self-control and you can exercise that. You don't have to always give in. You don't have to always follow everything in skirt. You don't always have. You don't have to be abusive. You know, so. I am very passionate about that because I believe I have a son. My youngest is a son. He's 28. He's not my I told me you're not allowed to be married until you're 30. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're making sure that you've trained him before then. He doesn't yeah. get a pass to yeah. date until yeah, he's 30. Absolutely. Amen. Because ultimately, I said to them, you will account to God. Not everybody who wants to be married is married. So the fact that because it is not your right to be married, you don't own her. She is not a chattel. She is not your property. You are, you are here to look, you, you are a steward and you will account to God what you've done with her. That office, that privilege that you have been given, you will account to God. Not everybody who wants to have children, have children, okay? The fact that you have children means that you, you, have been, you are a custodian of these children now and you will account back to God. What are you going to say back to God? Because whether you believe it or not, or whether you know it or not, does not matter. It still is what it is. God will ask you what you've done with the privileges that he's given. Life itself is, is a privilege. It's not a right. Not everybody that went to bed last night woke up this morning. So the fact that you have what you have, you have your family, you have to be grateful and you have to, to steward that family in a way that at least you've given your best. Nobody is perfect. There's no perfect parent. There's no perfect spouse. But you have to work towards perfection. It has to be what you want to do. So when, when that is what you desire to do, chances are that you will hit it right more than you will hit it wrong. Okay, so you're saying when someone's intention is set. Intention, yes. 
Okay. If you're always working towards excellence, if you are determined to say, you know, I'm going to get this right, I want to get this, and I'm working towards it, I'm taking steps, you know, to, to doing what will cause my marriage to be excellent, what will cause whatever it is, my children to be excellent. I'm investing myself in them, I'm making sacrifices for them. You know, um, when I when I speak to men, I remind them the Bible says that. You are the head of the home, just like Christ is the head of the church. And then we need to look at it. How is Christ the head of the church? Does he slap the church around? Does he, does he uh, 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 pro, uh, withhold privileges from, from the church? Does he do all of that? Does he not protect the church? Does he not provide for the church? Did he not die for the church? Okay. So I, Christ is the head of the church. You are, you are the head of your family as a man in the same way so christ has given us a pattern not not that you have to physically die and you okay. know but what we're saying that you have to be able to you have to be willing to make sacrifices you have okay. to love your family in such a way you will make sacrifice you deny yourself of some things maybe uh, i wanted to use this money to do something but my family needs it first so i'm going to go and I'm, i'll give it to my family i will invest in my family so there are responsibilities with the position is what you're saying. Absolutely. Chantelle, you wanted to ask a question. Yeah, I'm just um, going back because I can see like, you know, your role as a faith leader, it's, you know, as well as being God's messenger, you, there's like some sort of mentorship there as well, isn't there? Um, and you're drawn to women. And I can see that a lot of your experiences kind of influence some of the stuff that you're doing. Um, I wanted to know, how your position in faith as a woman differed to a man's position in the faith of is there not much difference there's not much difference see um the bible says in the book of galatians that there is neither male nor female it's the same holy spirit that is on the inside of them it's the same holy spirit that is, that's on the inside of me or of of the woman leader where the, the the gender the male female gender is is for it's just for um it's for functionality basically it, you know uh, what the function that women can undertake men cannot undertake them you know biologically and things like that but when it comes to the work of, of god and the work of the holy spirit especially if you know that you are called by god the god of the bible jehovah god and jesus christ is and if you believe all of that then you have to believe that the scripture is written to all of us. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 16, it says that you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and I have appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So that is not gender specific. That is to all of us. So your role and your calling is wasn't dependent on your gender. It, as you were called is as you will serve and your gender doesn't matter. It does not matter. The same scripture that, that, that the male will read is the same scripture that the female will read. So the Holy Spirit is, is one, is, is, is a spirit. It doesn't have a gender for, and he will use us. Where the, where the difference is, is that I may be able, I may be able to reach the women better than how a man may be able to reach the women and vice versa, you know, in terms of um, how we are wired. Um, um, when a woman comes to me for counseling, for example, they may find me more relatable or I may be able to understand them more than it, perhaps a man would. That is the only difference I, I have, personally, I have seen. Apart from that, um, it's the same Bible that everybody reads. It's the same Bible that everybody preaches from. So there really is no difference at all. Even though they, they have been, there have been all kinds of... Um, opinions in terms of uh, women should not be preaching or teaching and all of that. I try not to engage in that conversation except where I know that people are theologically based because I'm a theologian as well. All right? I just, I finished last year, I finished a degree in, in uh, theology and practical ministry. And at the moment I'm, I'm doing um, theology and leadership. Okay, so unless I know that I can, I can engage you academically 
and you, you can under, understand what the scripture is saying. Mm. I try not to get involved in emotional discussions because we're not going to get anywhere. Can I ask then, because you've got the, the theology and then you've got the man on the street and you can you minister to women from a personal perspective and also a spiritual perspective as well. When we were talking, I was looking at it from my point of view, a woman who stepped away from the church, but also a woman who has tested HIV positive. And I wanted to ask you, how do you see the role of ministers serving people who are positive? Because I work with many women who have lost faith, have stepped away, and I am trying to say to them, there is a place for you in the church. Mm -hmm. How do you serve that community, both men and women? I'm working with the women at the moment, but I also know so many men, again, who have stepped away and who may still hold an anger emotionally. How do, how do you or how does the church, because to me it's a 21st century issue, how, how do we manage HIV? Um, so I am not a uh, medical uh, person or clinician in any way. So, but in terms of how, uh, as a pastor, yes, how, do I, yeah, how do I um, approach them? The may, uh, HIV may not have been mentioned in the Bible, but leprosy was. Uh, leprosy is mentioned in, in Bible days. It, and leprosy in those days was some kind of an outcast or social, social um, disease. Mm. which unfortunately is how many people see HIV or AIDS, which it's not supposed to be. But if you are, if you are being real, if you're being practical, mm. that is how people perceive it, mm. okay? And that is why some of them feel like, well, if there's no place for me in your church, then what am I doing here? Right. What we want as, as Christian leaders, the first thing we need to understand is that we are called to serve everybody. And we have to have compassion. Compassion is part of the foundation. Jesus did not did not discriminate against anybody. There was a there's a, a place in the Bible where a man with a social disease came to him and said that if you are willing, you can heal me because he was an outcast. The, the culture in those days was that people who had such social diseases they would be cast out of the city. And they would have bells around their clothes or their legs so that when they walked, the bells would ring so mm -hmm. that, you know, to, I, people may identify them. So nobody wanted to talk to them. Uh, but this guy stood in front of Jesus and said that if you're willing, you can heal me. And Jesus said, he, Bible said he touched him. He touched him. And he said, I am willing, be healed. That is the God that we serve. Mm -hmm. That is the God that we serve. And the Bible said that immediately that, that guy was healed. Okay, so as Christian leaders, we need to have the heart of Jesus. We need to have the compassion, you know, that God has. Because where else, you know, if, if the world who, who don't know Christ um, castigates them and we too castigate them, where do we expect them? And then we can stand before God and say, oh, I love you, God. And how? how can you say you love God? It doesn't, it doesn't compute. So we, like, as I said earlier, and I'll say again, we, we serve God by serving people. We love God by loving his people. We may not be able to bring the healing and we might be able to bring healing because by the grace of God, there have been in my ministry, there have been, you know, um, healings and, and, and deliverance and stuff like that, you know, but, but at least give don't 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 close the door against people mm. give them access to god and my my approach is actually to you know the, my mission statement is passionate about your personal development and your spiritual growth so my approach is to open the door for people and to let them grow spiritually themselves you know in their work with god and i will come alongside them that is my approach so I don't enforce it on anybody, but I will walk alongside you if you want to grow, if you want to know God. I will mentor you. I will disciple you until I see you growing. 
and maturing in the Lord. And regardless, people who are not HIV positive have other diseases. How many times do you see them casting people with cancer out of church? It's a disease. It's a sickness, same as. So why would you have compassion on somebody who, have, who has cancer and not have compassion on somebody else who has some, another disease? So um, these days and age, from what I've been seeing so far among my, my circle of um, um, colleagues, mm. I think the pastors these days are beginning to realize that back in the days, they got it wrong. Back in the days, they got it wrong, right? And now the door is open. Unfortunately, we still have some who are so legalistic and so religious, and um, they believe that there is a list of do's and don'ts mm. before before you can have access to God. Um, whereas God says, come as you are. He, he may not leave you the same way you came, but he expects you to come as you are. It's up to him to, to change you into whatever he wants you to be. He's the one who has the power. Nobody else has the power to do that, but at least give people the opportunity to access that. So that is how I see faith in the 21st century. Okay. Thank you, Lara. Um, can I just ask, because you spoke about healing, and I know this is something that we've come across before with um, some people who are living with HIV, they've said, you know, they can be healed in church and whatnot. Is this something where you would do the healing and you would also you know, recommend taking treatment and listening to the health professionals and, you know, using that medication um, or is it purely leave the medication alone? God can heal you and... Oh, sorry. I, oh, well, I said, take your medication. Always take your medication. You see, this is in the Bible as well. If I, interestingly enough, I was, during my devotion to, um, this morning, you know, I came across that, that place in the Bible, the book of Second Kings, you know, where um, they said um, somebody was sick, you know, and God said to the prophet to take a um, 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 fig, you know, the fig, to go and put it on the, on, the, on the sickness so that the person can be healed. I'm trying to, I don't want to, you know, make this preachy, preachy, but I'm just saying that it's in the Bible. Now, God is God. He could have said that person should be healed instantly and they, they would have been healed. But he, he, he instructed that, you know, they should take some leaves, some fig leaves, mm. you know, to, to heal that person. You see, this is the thing about God. He is supernatural, right? And God is not um, discovered and his ways, is, his ways are not discovered. This is, what, this is why, where we as people, we get messed up. We, we mess everything up and we, mess, we get messed up ourselves. God is revealed. It's only by revelation. He is a spirit. And we cannot box him in, in a certain way. This is how he does this. No, don't take your medication because God is a healer. He will heal you. No, you're wrong. What if God wants to use the, he reserves the right to do whatever he wants to do. Okay. So I never tell people to stop taking their medication. They continue to take their medication. But if God decides that I'm going to heal you instantly, then he will do that. See, we, we, I am not a healer. I can't heal my own self. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Never mind healing anybody. But I am God's um, conduit or, or, or channel, you know, of power, of, of blessings, if you like. Many mm -hmm. times he will direct you, lay hand on somebody or pray for somebody, or he will give you a prayer language for somebody, a scripture for somebody, only because he wants to do a certain work in the, in the life of that person. You mm -hmm. at that time happen to be a channel. It's not about you. Because once that job is done, his spirit is still upon you, but the, the, that, that's over. It's not about you. It's about what God wants to do in that moment. So, so I never tell people to stop taking their medication because God may decide that's how he wants to heal them. Yeah. The most important thing is their heart with God and their work with God. That's the most important thing. Yeah, because that's the, the question that I was also interested in. It's not just the physical aspect for a, a lot of women. They have been married. They have never stepped outside of their home they have acquired from their husbands. And so it feels like a double burden. 
and, and a sense of I am being punished twice and then how how do we as a society support how do we as a church support these women these children these men who as you've said acquire an illness and then are treated as outcasts and is there a voice from the church that changes or is able to change that at the social attitude because you said the attitude to leprosy is out of date the attitude to cancer is out of date but I don't I don't know and I'm not aware of many churches who challenge the image of HIV and so many of the women I know feel like it's a door closed to them the men feel it's a door closed to them and how do we knock on the door to get back in rather than to stay out Oh, it's not close to them. I'm aware. I'm, I'm one voice. <laughs> I'm one voice. And I'm aware of many other um, Christian leaders who, who would never shut the door against the people that I'm aware of, you know, that mm -hmm. they'd never do that. Okay. But what I do, as I say, is to work with them, work with, if a person comes to me, for example, and I know that they have this issue, First and foremost, that, that person is broken, okay? They're broken, it's their brokenness. Like when I was going through mine, I was so broken. I just, I just, I was sad, you know? So when somebody's spirit is, has already been broken, you want, you just want to restore them. You just want to refresh them first. You just want to restore their dignity, their, their sense of identity, their, you know, first to know that nothing defines them nothing outside of you defines you the sickness does not define you your husband your title does not define you okay um whether you're a missus or a miss does not define you your identity comes from christ okay and we need to work with that first and once a person is established in who they are and they know who they are and they know the power that is that's working then i tell you it is attractive right. it is attractive if you restore people's confidence and their identity they know who they are and they don't have to um judge themselves by what they have the job that they have the, the marriage that they have or yeah. they don't have whatever that is good but that is not who take me out of that context and put me in another context I'm still who I am. You are still as powerful. You are still as talented. You are still as brilliant. You still have, you still have all your gifts and your abilities and you can still be everything. And that is what I love to work with people with. And once we begin to work with them, obviously other, all, all the other issues, I see them as the peripherals. They are not that they're not important, but they're not the center, they're not the core. So once we deal with the core, somebody who is broken, if you're able to restore them and give them back the confidence, maybe to go back to work or maybe to go back to school or maybe to start the business that they've been wanting to start or do something that they wanted to do. And they, they, they're feeling fulfilled, they're feeling accomplished. And then alongside all these other things about them, we can begin to, to work with them um, about that as well. You, if you know a person who knows who they are in, in the Lord, it will not matter what another pastor says to them um because you know that ultimately that you know they didn't die for you <laughs> yeah so you know? your your strength really in everything comes through your personal relationship then with god it does mm. it does because otherwise there are enough people ar around you that wants to dominate you that want to control you that that want to manipulate you yeah. um and even as I speak today, I still have to deal with that. And they just find, who is this woman that is making waves? Up until 2016, we, I was pastoring a church in a brick and mortar. But I believe the Lord said to me in 2015 to wind it down and he wanted me in the media. So I took, uh, we, I think the last service that we had in the brick and mortar church building was the Easter um, in 2016, the Easter Sunday. And that was it. And I'm, we didn't even know that there was going to be pandemic and social distancing or anything like that. 
you know, this was in 2016, and I took and I took uh, my ministry, brought it on, you know, in the media, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and, and TV station, you know, Sky TV, and all of that, uh, and we began to operate from there. And because we're, we're now in the social media, we are able to access people from different parts of the world. Right. Because it, it's Facebook, it's World Wide Web. Anybody can access it. You don't know where they're listening in from. And I'm, I'm able to minister to people from different parts of, of, of the world. And initially, when, when I started, there were enough people who were calling me e-pastor. <laughs> who were calling me e-pastor who thought that what I was doing was silly. It was because God never called me in the first place. You know, um, I was uh -huh. out of my depth. That's why I jacked it in. And all, where is everybody today? We are all e-pastors. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Us, I've been forced online, but God gave me, you know, a heads up, you know. So it's about if you're focused on God, not saying I'm perfect because nobody is, not saying I won't make mistakes, I won't get it wrong because everybody does. But ultimately, if you focus on the person who has assigned you, mm -hmm. this is my assignment. If he will, he's faithful enough. He is faithful enough to guide you even when you get it wrong he is faithful enough to guide and to bring the right people alongside you so there are people like you you know nobody nobody is is uh, oh nobody else love god is just me no there are other people who are like-minded who yeah. god will bring and i'm speaking from experience he will bring such people alongside you who wants to serve god and serve his people who don't want um to be powerful and the big and all of this aggrandizement oh, repulses me <laughs> you know who who are focused on serving god and how would we find you how would we find <laughs> you because i'm just thinking you know yeah. we've got an e-minister before us and i'm thinking okay then because the the first thing you want to do is you want to now write go online and find and then see your work how would we be able to share that with everybody or sh with with our groups Go to Liberty Ministries International on Facebook. Like our page. Go to Liberty Ministries International on YouTube channel. Subscribe to our channel. Okay. I'm also on um, Sky Channel uh, 589. Eight, 859. Okay. I'm hoping Chantel, who is brilliant <laughs> with typing, is just typing away and throwing typing that in. This, I'm yeah. going to put it in the chat box. And just to let you know, we've got yeah, a channel 589 yeah. Sky oh. on every Tuesday at 5.30. 589, okay. not 859. 589. Yeah, okay. I've got it. 589, channel 589 Sky. And I've got Liberty Ministries International on Facebook and YouTube. Yes. Put that in the end chat box and I'll also make reference to it when we put it on. The yes. Okay, chat. brilliant. I could see yes. it. Yeah, I knew this would happen when I met you and we started talking <laughs> because you think you've got an hour and you think, oh, my God, I've got to fill it, got to fill it. Um, how am I going to do that? And, and we, we're nearly at the end. And I'm thinking, oh, no, time's run out. And I know that yeah, we've not hit the to do list of things. <laughs> so I know I've taken up the start of this, but Chantel, were there more questions? I know I've almost left it right to the end to give you the opportunity but is there a core question that you would like i mean has anybody else got any questions i just put yeah. to put in the chat box i've got um somebody here who's put a comment in saying it's interesting discussion and thank you there was um one question that i was going to ask and it was who are the communities that you preach to yeah. um, and you know i was assuming to begin with it was black african black british black caribbean um and what the faith perspective was within those communities but you're saying that you're reaching worldwide you, you're reaching everyone um so I, I suppose you've kind of answered that question haven't you um and you wouldn't really be able to see the differences within your congregations would you um if you I mean um because obviously because I'm black um you 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 kind of attract your like yeah. So I do attract people like myself, black men, black women, and um, but I'm available to everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm available to everybody. That's great. 
I know that for me, the notion of faith is really important, whether it's in or outside of a church for the women that I work with and the men that I work with. So it would be great to be able to do more work with people about faith and HIV so that those who've had to step away now know that there is a space where they can engage in faith without feeling fearful. Um, and so I would like to do more about that if possible. Mm. Um, I think it would be great also to look at the relationships and how you work with the women and how you give men that sense of themselves so that you talk about being head of the household, but it's that new vision that you were talking about, how women hold their own, but how a man respects a woman's place and how we can have relationships that aren't about domination and that a clear language, because you've talked about breaking down barriers and stereotypes. And so it'd be really good to, I think for our listeners to be able to see you in action demonstrating almost like um, a mentor how it can be done for those who are interested in taking a faith step into the 21st century absolutely I would love to do that I would love to do that with them absolutely brilliant any last thoughts for us reverend or Lara <laughs> um it's just to know that um God loves you and no matter what happened to you, whatever happened to you does not define you. It's an event. Unfortunately, we live in a world where events are used to, to label people. And somehow we assume the labels and we walk the labels. But in the eyes of God, it was just an event. You are bigger than that. You are bigger than the event that occurred in your life. Mm -hmm. And there's so much more. The fact that you are breathing you live in this breath of God in your body. There's so much more that God can do with you and through you. Trust me, I'm an example. I'm a living example. There is so much more that is ahead of you, more than what was behind, no matter how good it was, no matter how bad it was. I'm going to encourage people today to um, lift up their eyes and, and look at God. Um, don't look at what other people are saying, you know, so much. Don't even look at what I'm saying. Look at God. What is God saying? Open your heart. God is spirit, you know. If you, you are a spirit being, you live in a body and you have a soul. So you are a spirit being and God will connect to you, spirit to spirit. If you open up your spirit, if you allow him, even tonight, I know that he will minister to you. He will speak to you. He will comfort you. Just very quickly, because I'm mindful of, of the time, there is a woman that had given up on God. And she said that, you know, one time, you know, God told her, I, I preached a message on the necessity of his presence. God told us, go and uh, watch that video, you know, and he went and watched it. And he said that he dreamt that he saw me. She saw, she said that she dreamt, she saw me in, in a dream, comforting her, encouraging her. And she knew it was not me, it was God. But God used the image. Again, going back God to so God will use what you are familiar with. You know, God was able to minister to her because spirit to spirit, because what she was going through at the time, you know, physically, logically, it was over. So trust God to know that let him open your spirit to him and let him speak to you spirit to spirit and to see how much more is still ahead of you. Very encouraging words, very encouraging words. Chantel, as you opened, so can you close? Yeah. So Your final you. words. Thank you. Um, thank you once again, Reverend Lara, for you. Um, also, I can see that you did, you know, you have commitments um, and, you, you know, you've put, you've actually come um, forward and helped us thank with the today. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined the discussion. You can email us at speakeasy at the bha.org.uk if you've got any questions or if you want anything further, you can go on Liberty Ministries International on Facebook and YouTube to check Lara out um, and also Sky Channel 589 
um, and hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending. It's been an interesting discussion and thank you for your time, Reverend Lauren. Thank you from me and I look forward to more sessions with you again. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no, it's been lovely. Thank you all. Thank everyone you. take care and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.